Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Now, if you're feeling a little depressed or even like suicidal, I would suggest that you wait until you're in a better mood to listen to this video because we're talking about Biss's complete Alan Pedersen edition, the darkest, most emotionally wrenching of all the symphonists in the entire 20th century. The guy who makes Shostakovich sound positively cheerful in comparison. I mean, this is unbelievable stuff. It really is. It is dark. It is gripping. It is powerful. It is relentless. And uh, if you just aren't ready to stomach it, well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, Pedersen was unquestionably one of the great symphonists of the 20th century. This is what he did. He wrote 16 of these suckers and, and uh, a, a bit of a 17th. Actually, his symphonic production starts with number two, um, but because he never finished number one. But, nah, you know, nobody ever, no composer ever leaves anything unfinished if the musical world has anything to say about it. And Christian Lindbergh has produced a performing version of what is legible of Symphony Number no. 1, which is in here. And you also get a fragment of his 17th symphony, um, which is only a few minutes long. And there's also a separate symphonic movement. And there, of course, is his, you know, number 12 is his choral symphony. Um, jolly piece that that is, based on poems by Pablo Neruda, The Death in the Plaza, Los Muertos en la Plaza, whatever it is, it's in Spanish. And there's also his choral work, Vox Humana. I mean, this is the complete works, not just the complete symphonies. So you also get his, his viola concerto. Oh, there's a jolly piece. And his concertos for string orchestra, numbers one through three. And, and let's see, it's like I said, Vox Humana, which is another Neruda thing. Um, and six songs and his barefoot songs, the orchestration of the barefoot songs, and all of his chamber music, including his pieces for two solo violins, and other little little doodads that he he tossed out now and again, um, and that's basically his entire life's work. And there there's something, I, you know, Pedersen lived from 1911 to 1980, and there's usually a lot of talk about how, you know, he came from a very poor background, and his father was an alcoholic, and he was he was never wealthy, and of course he became a violist, which is possibly the most awful thing that can ever happen to a musician. I mean, note the viola concerto. You can tell when you listen to the viola concerto. Um, you know, God was punishing him by making him a violist. And and he, he had, uh, you know, just just a rotten life, essentially, a poor life. And uh, although he had quite a measure of acclaim, um, he was an angry and, I, I, I don't know, I don't, wouldn't say he was embittered. His music isn't bitter. It's defiant. It's defiant and and it's always striving for for peace. You know, there are these lyrical oases in his music that are quite beautiful, um, and and you can you can hear you know grasping for a, a beauty that's often denied. I mean, this is this is he claimed that his symphonies were simple facts, reportage, and maybe they were. He suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. He was very sick for for many many years. Um, really, really at a difficult life and the struggle is reflected in his music. One thing he did understand, though, and I, this goes to the fact that I don't think that for all of its darkness, and it is dark, I mean, is it dark, um, it, it's not embittered, is that he understood, you know, he studied with everybody. He studied with Messian and, and Mio and, and like all the French people and Rene Leibowitz and also with Blomdahl and, and Sweden. And it really had a, a terrific upbringing musically, a terrific pedigree. And people don't often mention that in connection with his music, but he really, really poured himself into his craft. The craft of writing this music is extremely well written, very difficult to play, which is why a lot of it isn't done very often. Not entirely rewarding for the audience in the sense that you sit through these hour-long harangues, you know, full of angst and 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 blackness and despair and 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 then you know they always end quietly or usually they end quietly 
I, it, it's not it's not that easy. I mean, his 16th symphony is for a saxophone and orchestra. It's a concertante symphony. Most of his pieces are in one movement. Only the third, I think, has four movements, and the eighth has two. There's a couple that have some sectional breaks, but basically they're just big, long exordia. Some of the later ones are quite short, 20 minutes or so in a single movement. Those aren't so hard to take, um, but they require intense, serious, devoted listening. Because what Pedersen discovered, and this is the thing, you know, he was educated rigorously in serial technique and 12-tone technique. And, you know, his most avant-garde pieces are his earliest ones. For example, his first violin concerto, which is for violin and string quartet, or the early string symphonies, which are really, really tormented and difficult and, and, and naughty and just deliberately obstreperous. You know, later, he became actually easier to listen to. And he really sort of found his symphonic footing with the Fifth Symphony. And I think the Sixth is his first, you know, sort of what you might call his mature work and his mature style, where you have this, these, these beautiful lyrical episodes offset by passages of, of ferocious violence and, and blackness and darkness. And oh, my goodness. But I keep getting digressing. What Pedersen discovered was this when it came to atonal music, because there are passages in all of his works that you, know, you could call atonal, I suppose. But the point is that if you really want to express existential angst or expressionist horror, or whatever he was about there, um, or pain and suffering, you got to have contrast. You got to have contrast. He, he returned to tonality because he understood that using tonal materials contrasted with things which were much less so, um, extremes of dissonance and you know rhythmic jaggedness and whatnot. That, that's how you create expression. Expression in music is a function of contrast and his pieces are very, very highly contrasted. You would not be able to call them, you know, you know the, the, the deepest pits of utter despair unless that feeling was opposed to hope to the possibility of release, to calm, to, you know, all of those pieces, those things are in his music. I wouldn't say there's any humor. <laughs> I mean, humor there is not um, in Pedersen's music. No, 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 no. But contrast there is. And the contrast is always at the service of the musical expression. So while these are difficult works and emotionally gut-wrenching and you know whatnot, um, they are designedly so and not uh, self-indulgently so. They're very, very cleverly and and technically adroitly planned, um, which is all a good thing. The man knew what he was about. So anyway, um, what do we get here? I told, as I've said, you've got um, the 17 symphonies, the two violin concertos. Don't forget those. There's two. There's a much later one he wrote for Ida Handel. I'll bet she was surprised to get that. Ooh, she did record it. Um, and, and all the other stuff. Uh, the performers are the Newark Cupping Symphony Orchestra, the Nordic Chamber Orchestra, the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra, under Christian Lindbergh, Leif Segerstam, and Stig Vesterberg. Now, Christian Lindbergh is is doing a complete Pedersen cycle, but Biss had already recorded some of these things with Leif Segerstam. The performances are marvelous, all of the, the Newark Cupping Orchestra. Um, and I remember when they started doing it, and I was talking to Robert von Barr about um, you know, when are they going to do the rest? And Segerstam, too, about it, too. And he said, they all said the same thing, which is uh, the reason this takes so much time, and it took so much time, is because the music is ferociously difficult to play, and you have to get the orchestra. The orchestra has to be willing to schedule it. I mean, they have to be willing to learn it and to do it. And these are conductors who, who brook no dispute when it comes to getting excellent results from their orchestras. Um, Lindbergh, I understand, is going to complete his um, Pedersen cycle with the duplicates of the pieces that that Segerstam already recorded. He has already done the seventh, and Segerstam recorded the seventh, and it's supposedly there's an eighth coming out as well, and then um, and maybe the, uh, some others. I haven't actually you know done the comparisons to see exactly what's lacking in that cycle. So there may be some more Pedersen coming on Bis. Um, that's the amazing thing about Bis, the label, which you know you might say is either fabulous or crazy, but when they do something complete. It's really uber complete. Now, CPO is also doing complete Pedersen, by the way, and has a complete symphony cycle with different conductors, um, some of which is live, some of which is a little more tentative. I, I, there's no question that these are the better performances overall. 
Um, I, the CPOs have some wonderful performances as well. And uh, there's even a couple on, on Orfeo. Uh, so, and I remember, oh, I remember so vividly. When I was in college um, at Johns Hopkins as an undergrad, the, the Baltimore Symphony was led by Sergio Comissiona, and he had been in Sweden, and he also recorded Pedersen, and he did a recording of the Eighth Symphony with the Baltimore Symphony, which was on Deutsche Grammophon in those days, and that was such a big deal. But the funny thing about it, of course, was that the Baltimore Symphony was not a known orchestra in Comissiona's days. I mean, they never made recordings of anything. I think this was like their first major recording of anything. And I just thought it was so ironic that, you know, all of the the Baltimoreans, as we used to call them, um, the Baltimoreans who are supporting the Baltimore Symphony, and rightly so. I mean, it was a good, a good organization, uh, but, but you know, their big souvenir <laughs> was going to be the Pedersen Eighth Symphony. Um, you know, we wanted, we used, we, we called that the top of the lyric album because they all played in the lyric theater, and we all said that you know, once you played it, you wanted to like go to the roof and jump off of it when it was over. So you know, that those were the early days. Um, the early days, and one of the things that sort of uh, makes me thoughtful about this and, and appreciative, frankly, because it is an unbelievable achievement. It's a magnificent achievement. I mean, the performances are all top notch. The sonics are fabulous. The playing is marvelous. I mean, well, you know, there's nothing to complain about. But one of the things that really, really gets me about this is that now that this has been sold to uh, who is it, Apple Music or whatever, you just wonder, you know, where in the in the universe of Apple Music, um, is there going to be room for the complete Pedersen edition and duplicate recordings of some of these symphonies? It's the kind of thing that only an uber connoisseur um, would really do. A label that was run by, you know, a, a whack doodle like Robert von Barr, you know, somebody who was fanatical in his devotion to the music and and to to you know the artistic integrity of the product. I mean, I. I I am very curious to know what's going to happen. And therefore, I suggest to you that you grab your BIS things, especially the interesting stuff, the unusual composers, the complete editions, those wonderful projects, while you can, because I have no, no clue as to what's going to happen. The only thing I can hope is because this stuff all exists now, is that it'll all, it will all simply get digitized. I mean, I've seen that this is already available on, on iTunes is a download um, at something like full price or at 10 bucks a disc. It's like $170, which is a lot um, for a download, in my view, because after all, when you're downloading something, you're getting nothing. <laughs> you're getting just, just digi bits. Um, I would much rather feel comfortable paying real money for a real physical product because you're giving physical money for a physical product. But anyway, um, this is here. It's been a labor of love over decades. Uh, it really, an extraordinary achievement. Absolutely an extraordinary achievement of music that is a connoisseur's music, of course. Connoisseurs and schizophrenics and psychotics and manic depressives and people like that. Uh, it's it's uh, an experience. Let's just put it that way. So you've been warned, but it's out. It's here. and And I'm... For one, I for one am very happy to have it. There are moments when, when I don't mind listening to this stuff, but I enjoy it. It's good on a long trip, long, long trip, very, 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 very long trip. And uh, it, like I said, it's an extraordinary achievement. And classical music connoisseurs will all be happy to have the opportunity to either dip into it or to jump into it. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.